Uh, you're do marang my in marinya. Good day, everyone. Uh, you and do Paul Girwa. Uh, my name is Paul Girwa. Na do marai biringu gujigangu nyambi nurumbango dara. I was born here at the centre of my ancestral country at the Old Canberra Hospital. God bless it. Anyone born in the Old Canberra Hospital? How many? We must be an endangered species. <laughs> so, Yilingalong bo, giba bango wuga bo, migay bo, dira nil bang main. Ladies and gentlemen, young men, young women, distinguished guests, the Honourable Julia Gillard, Nyari and Jamali, Nyambri, Gumal, Wogalu, Wallablo, Nunawa, Radri Mujigang, Yanang Bujayandu. My respects to Nyambri, Gumal, Wogalu, Wallablo, Nunawa, Radri elders, past and present. Nyari and Jamarabu, Mujigangu, Nurumbanjigu, and Ninya Yiridu. My respects to all people and elders from all parts of the country. Nyambri, Wogalu, Wallablo, Nunawa, Radri, Mayingam Banya, Ninyoga, Nurumbangodara, Nyambri, Nunawa, Radri people, welcome you all to country. Mambawara Naminyagu, Wura Gabinya, Wura Daraigo, Winningala Gu Baligu, looking to see, listening to hear, learning to understand. Yinjamal Gijul, Yinjamarabu, Yinjamali. It's a powerful word on country. It means many different things. It's an ideology, it's a philosophy. It means to go slow, be patient, be kind, be show respect, take responsibility, all those good nutrients. Yinjimara Magagiri Biringa Bogongu Durunda. Respect can be found in the journey of the Bogong Moss in the mountains. Yinjimara Bala Walam Wanga Dabu, Murmadan Dabu, Bamayu Gurungambira. Respect can be found in the grinding stones and the carved trees made long ago on country. Yinjimara Bala Birida Bina Bira Wuru and Yambri Julong. Respect can be found in the Cambri Creek flowing through country. A respectful way of life cares for country. Be brave, make change. Our welcome to countries are always made in the spirit of peace and a desire for harmony for all peoples of the modern ACT and surrounds. And our main aim as local custodians is to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our rights to declare our special place in the pre and post history of the region. The name Canberra is derived from the name of our people and country, the Nyambri, the Canberra, right here at the ANU campus. Respect is taking responsibility for the now, the past, the present and the future. We want to see our children grow up in a society that acknowledges, respects and honours First Nation people of this country. We have cared for Mother Earth since the dawn of time and evidence of our statehood, our sovereignty, our ownership can be seen everywhere throughout the land. Our signature is in the land. Not just our DNA and taking care of country is important to us all. The more we look after country, the land and waters, the more they look after us. Yinjamara a mara mara, nye 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 girama maranya. Respect shapes us and lifts up the people. So it's wonderful to be here. Noyo goya malang, marambang malang. It's wonderful, it's fabulous to be here to be able to share our, some of our story and connection to country. We must remember under the concrete and the steel and the glass of our cities and our country towns, there's a rich, powerful, compelling First Nation history, a 65,000 year old history which is now a shared history that belongs to all of us. We all have a responsibility in looking after country. Nain mura, nain mura burumba bira, sharing, caring, and looking after country, Nurumbangodara. So with that, uh, Reconciliation Week means many different things to all of us. The restoration of friendly relations with us all. I'd like to acknowledge my mother, Dr. Ani Matilda House. Because of her, I can. Because of the many matriarchs uh, in our lives, my life, our life, all of our lives, because of our matriarchs, we can. And I'd like to acknowledge my mother in particular as the first Indigenous Australian to be awarded an honorary doctorate here from the ANU in 2017 and honour all 
acknowledge, respect and honour all people from all parts of the country. That is the law of the land. So Gaim Banya, Gurubari, welcome. Mandangu, Wurugawari, thank you. Before I go, before I go, I just want to play a quick welcome song uh, on the Yiriki. And the wonderful Michelle here, the MC, is going to join me on the clapping sticks. Thank you so much for that fantastic welcome, Paul, and I hope I didn't ruin it too much by being completely out of time. But to have Paul welcome us in language is truly very special and such an honour. Thank you. National Reconciliation Week is an important time for us all to reflect on our individual and collective contributions to Australia's reconciliation journey. Here at ANU, we have a range of events and activities to mark the week that you're all invited to including our annual National Reconciliation Lecture. This year, the lecture will be presented by proud Waramungu and Larakia woman and ANU alumna, Andrea Kelly, from the National Indigenous Australians Agency. To register and find out more, please uh, head over to our ANU website. So I'd like to start off today with a brief introduction to the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, or JUUL, as we like to call it. And I'd like to give a very short presentation on some of the mistakes that organisations tend to make when they're pursuing workplace gender equality. We'll then be joined on stage by Jules founder and chair, the Honourable Julia Gillard, who will facilitate a panel discussion with our very special guests. So a little bit about us and about Jewel. Julia Gillard founded the Global Institute for Women's Leadership in 2018 at King's College in London. And a number of years later, Jewel ANU was established in 2020 as the first international outpost. We think of ourselves as the little sister Jewel. Um, and we've got a focus on the Asia Pacific region. So what we try and do is address issues of gender equality and issues of, of workplace inequality particularly with a sort of three-pronged attack. We're ultimately a research institute. That's why we're based here at the Australian National University in terms of world-leading research. So what we try to do is draw together existing knowledge that we know about, but also create new knowledge to make sure that we have a really strong evidence base for change. We engage in advocacy and engagement with the public and with organisations, with people that engage in policy and practice. And we bring together experts. So we have some of the experts based in our institute. We have other experts within the ANU. But we also have a worldwide network of experts that we draw on to really make sure that we're making sure that the discourse stays on track, that we're talking about issues of gender equality. And we also um, really focus on practice. So it's not just about talking and doing research, but it's about translating that research into practice. And that's really a lot of what we want to focus on today. So making sure that the interventions and the policy and practice that we have in place are truly evidence-based. So in terms of our research priorities and where we really want to focus going forwards at Juul, 
We want to look and make sure that we're doing things that result in systemic change. So it's not about small tweaks here and there, it's not about fixing women, but it's about changing systems, it's about changing culture, it's about changing society, so that we get big change across the board that's lasting change as well. We want to make sure that everything that we do is intersectional. A lot of the time, a lot of the time, a lot of the work that we do often focuses on particular groups of women, and often those most privileged women. So we want to recognise that women have very different experiences across the board, and that there are intersect intersecting experiences with class, with race, with disability, with sexuality, and we want to make sure we take those into account as well. And we really want to make sure that we test these evidence-based solutions and really take forward real and lasting change. So one of the things I just wanted to really briefly talk about is based on some recent, uh, a recent paper that I published in Nature magazine just a couple of months ago in April that looks at some of the common missteps that are made when we try and make change. And this is particularly, the paper looked particularly at what organizations might accidentally get wrong or inadvertently get wrong. One of the things that I think we often do is put an overemphasis on numbers, on quantity. Now, I think that's important. We need to know how many women there are in parliament or how many fe female CEOs that we have. That's absolutely something that we need to know and we need to take account of, but it's not enough. We also need to know what the experiences are in those roles. If we've got female candidates in the election, for example, that we just had a couple of weeks ago, are they in winnable seats or not? When they are elected, are they given positions of power and influence in the ministry, for example? So it isn't just about looking at uh, numbers. It's also about looking at the nature of those positions. It's not just about quantity, it's also about quality. So we need to go beyond just simply tallying the number of women around. I think the second thing that organizations inadvertently do is when looking at gender equality, they focus just on women. They often try and fix women. So they give leadership courses, for example, confidence training, negotiation training, as if it's a deficit in women that is the, the base of you know, women's underrepresentation, rather than systemic and built-in inequalities. So we need to move away from that. We need to move away from fixing women to fixing systems. And the final one is, sometimes, is something around over-optimism. I think there has been great change. We've absolutely seen things get better. We've seen improvements. But sometimes that optimism of change um, doesn't quite have the right balance. We need to celebrate our wins, but we also need to recognize where things stagnate and where things unfortunately go backwards. Uh, when we survey people, they often overestimate the number of women that are in a room, the number of women in leadership positions, and how, we, how well women are doing in society. And we need to find that right balance between celebrating wins, but also really fundamentally understanding persistence of inequality. There's some really interesting research that part of my team has been doing that shows that those people that fail to recognize gender inequality are actually, and the ones that say, oh, it's fine, we're much more equal than we ever were, are the ones that are most likely to perpetuate inequality as well. So these are all the things, these common missteps that are often made. But I don't want to focus just on missteps. And actually, some of the reason that we're here, the most of the reason that we're here today is focusing on not what people do wrong, but actually what people do right, the things that are going well, the things that are um, being done, the evidence base, the change that's actually happening. So one of the things that I really want to do is introduce the panel. And instead of thinking about the things that aren't going well, really celebrate the things that are doing uh, that are going um, really well instead of going badly. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. So our chair of our panel is uh, Julia Gillard, our founder, um, who is going to facilitate the discussion today. We're going to be joined um, by a panel of uh, a panel of four panelists. Ha <laughs> 
Welcome, Julia. You can see how happy everyone is to have you here up on the stage. So in terms of introducing our panelists, I'd first like to introduce Dr. Nikki Vincent. Nikki is Victoria's inaugural commissioner for gender equality in the public sector and is responsible for the implementation of Victoria's Gender Equality Act. Prior to this, Nikki served as the South Australian Commissioner for Equal Opportunity and was the founder and CEO of the Leaders Institute of South Australia. Nikki is also an active foster parent and an ambassador for Time for Kids to a Respite Foster Care Organisation. Welcome, Nikki. Also joining us today is Dr. Jane Gunn. Jane is the partner in charge of KPMG Australia's People and Change Practice. Jane's focus is on strategy, change management, leadership development, and human resources management. Jane has authored a number of papers on the impact of COVID-19 on ways of working and holds an ANU PhD in organisational behaviour and strategy. Welcome, Jane. And our third panellist today is Geraldine Chin Moody. Geraldine is a non-executive director of Future Supergroup, a super fund committed to sustainability by tackling inequality and climate change. Geraldine has held many senior executive and board roles across ASX listed companies and is on the board of the ANU Centre for Asian Australian Leadership, as well as Welcoming Australia and Giving Kind. Welcome. And our fourth panellist today is Mary Wooldridge, the Director of Workplace Gender Inequality. I'm sorry, of Work a Gender Equality Agency. Welcome, Mary. I know that you've just gotten off a flight and raced here, and as I was introducing you, I wasn't actually sure whether you were going to walk out or not. So it's absolutely terrific to have you here. Pri oh. So that's your clap for your actually turning up. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about Mary's wonderful history as well. Prior to taking on this role in May last year, Mary served in the Victorian Parliament from 2006 to 2020. During this time, she held several ministerial portfolios, including the Minister for Women's Affairs, where she worked to implement the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children and the establishment of Our Watch. Mary also established the Victorian Commission for Children, worked in the private sector, and was CEO of the Foundation for Young Australians. Welcome, Mary. So, with that fantastic panel, I'm going to hand over to Julia. Thank you very much, Michelle, and a big hello to everybody. It's great to join you here in Canberra on what is a cold day, but a very important day. Now, I want you to absolutely focus on the history here. You would know that we decided to hold this event uh, after the election, so the date was known. And I just want to suggest to you that because the date of this event was known, Prime Minister Albo decided to put the swearing in of a record number of women on the same day to mark this event. Anyway, that's... <laughs> I think, I think that's, that's the way round we should record the history anyway, if you can join me in that. Uh, of course, everybody is talking about uh, women and gender equality in the context of the election result and what it means for the incoming government. Our purpose today is to do something a bit different. We are going to do a deep dive around what making gender equality come to life means from various perspectives. And I'm just so delighted to be joined by such an eminent panel to do just that. So we are going to have a conversation and thank you very much for coming today to be involved in it. Even though Mary has just literally rushed off a plane, I'm going to start with her. Um, we introduced uh, the Gender Equality Act in 2012. Now, people would be asking themselves 10 years later, does legislating work? Has it changed things? What's the impact of the law been? Can you give us a view on that? Absolutely. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, with you, uh, Julia, and everyone today and the panel. Um, and first of all, full credit to your government for introducing the Workplace Gender Equality Act. Yeah. 
So there's no doubt that it has an impact. Um, it absolutely does. And I think uh, there's a, a hierarchy or some levels of how legislative uh, uh, changes uh, can have an impact in relation to it. And I think um, we have an act that requires reporting in relation to gender equality. Uh, and that has uh, brought a focus to the issues it, uh, within organisations, but also enables us as WGIA to um, advocate uh, from a fact-based and a data-based uh, position. And there's the accountability uh, in relation to there being consequences that uh, companies that don't report have access to uh, or are unable to participate in government tenders. So there's consequence there as well, which, which drives the over 95% compliance rate. But I think now 10 years on uh, is actually an opportunity for further change because what we know, we think there's probably about 25 to 30% of companies that are quite engaged and taking action in relation to um, not only having the data but doing something with it. And we now need to work out how we take that to another level. And I think the next level is around transparency because we don't have the capacity to report gender pay gaps and any information related to remuneration in companies. We do it at an industry level but not at an individual company level. And the UK five years ago introduced gender pay gap reporting and what their um, early evaluation or their five-year evaluation is showing that it has reduced the gender pay gap. Um, and over 50% of their companies are now taking action or have plans to take action in relation to gender equality uh, and making a difference because of that transparency and because of that pressure um, from not only their own employees but more broadly. And we, so we believe we need that transparency in terms of the gender pay gap at a, at a company level. And the third step though is requiring companies to not only have transparency but actually take some action because at the moment they're only required to report. So can we push that further to say, you know, not only do you have to report, but you actually have to have a plan. You have to take action and you have to be accountable to making progress. Um, and that's a third step that we think, you know, once again, takes it up another level that is needed to get beyond that only 50% to get to, to really build in the hearts and minds of, of taking actions across countries, uh, across companies. Um, and we're really pleased we have been funded in the last budget to do both that transparency and to work with companies to make commitments to drive action um, and, and be accountable for actually making progress, not just reporting the numbers. Thank you for that perspective on how we could build on the Act, which is now 10 years old. I've had the opportunity to be in London doing work with the Global Institute for Women's Leadership there when the gender pay gap reporting has come out. And there's no doubt that the fact that it identifies a company, so you can literally see that, you know, a business called Smith & Jones has X gender pay gap is a motivator for change. And there's been some research done by Jewel in the UK on the best uh, legislative practice practices around the gender pay gap. But I'm going to turn now to Nikki on this question of what makes good law and good regulation. Uh, you're from Victoria, which has introduced the Gender Equality Act in 2020, and that act was described as fairly revolutionary. Uh, can you tell us what it does, who it applies to, and perhaps some of the thoughts that could build on a federal reform agenda? Thank you for that. Yes, it, it does the things that Mary was just talking about. It covers, it is the first kind of, uh, first legislation of its kind in Australia. It covers 300 organisations in Victoria, including the Victorian Public Service, which is the second largest employer in Australia. So covers um, all of the public service, um, the public service more broadly, all the nine universities in Victoria and all of local government. Um, and what it does is have a, a positive duty to progress gender equality and there are several other um, obligations. Each organisation has to undertake a workplace gender audit across seven key indicators, including things like the composition of the workforce and governing bodies and sexual harassment and pay equality or inequality as we normally find. 
and so on. All of the things that we know need to be measured and need to change. But it then has to report that data to me, uh, and then that data is all made public. So anyone can search, or will be able to search, our database to see what each organisation uh, looks like on those indicators, and we'll also be able to track how they change over time, and there's a responsibility for them to make reasonable and material progress in every two-year period. They also have to take that data, consult with their workforce, their governing bodies and their union uh, representatives and develop gender equality action plans to address any inequality they find. And again, they have to make progress on that in every two-year period and report that progress to me. So all that data, all of those um, plans are made public and anyone can track how they're going. And it also will mean there's some competition because no one will want to be the bottom of their sector and so forth. So it does introduce not only transparency, but some competitive element elements to it as well. Um, the other really um, important obligation is that they must undertake gender impact assessments on every new or up for review policy program or service that they deliver that has a direct and significant public impact. And when you think about the organisations the Act covers, the public sector, universities, local government, a lot of what they do has a direct and significant impact on the public. And so all of that will have a gender lens over it um, from now on, and they have to report on all of those gender impact assessments that they have done to me as well. And there are real teeth. So if they don't report to me on their audit, on their gender equality action plans, on their progress reports and their gender impact assessments, not only will that be publicly transparent, because there'll be a lack of those things uh, that, that are on their websites and on our um, pl uh, platform, but they're also, I can also take action with them. We're really about focusing, especially right now, as we're bringing the legislation into effect, on helping organisations get over the line. And we'll keep doing Doing that. That's where we need to start to help um, get compliance. But if we still don't get compliance, I can get their minister involved, I can name and shame, but I can also take them to the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal to get an order directing them to comply. And when you think about that, I hope I never have to use it, but it's something that speaks of uh, the fact that gender equality in Victoria is no longer a nice to have, it's a must have. And all of that would be public, and I don't think any public organisation is going to want to be dragged to, to VCAT, so I'm hoping that that will all um, mean that, that we get compliance. And so far we have. We've only just started, but we've, we've got the data in. Almost every organisation is compliant, and we're just getting the plans in now. I also have a unique power in dispute resolution. So, like um, most of you would probably be aware, if you get uh, have a sexual harassment complaint or a complaint about gender inequality in your workplace, you can take that to your state anti-discrimination or um, tr um, territory anti-discrimination body. But if you are a group of workers who feel your workplace is unsafe and you might be susceptible to sexual harassment or your, your employer is not doing anything about the pay gaps or not anything substantial about the pay, pay gaps, you as a group of employees can bring that complaint to me uh, and I will help resolve that complaint as long as there's a, a clause in your EBA that allows me to do that and, and all of the workplaces in Victoria that cover, are covered by the Act are currently putting that in. We haven't had a discussion yet, but I'm sure once the data's out there, we, we might start getting those in. So it's the first time that a state statutory officer has been given um, powers under federal EBAs. We've also got the possibility to set, set targets and quotas. We won't do that until we're really sure about the data that we've got and what progress is being made and what might, might need to be pushed along a bit with those sorts of things. And we can also um, develop funding guidelines for, for government funding around gender equality and also procurement as well. So there's a lot in it and it's really exciting. There is a lot in it, and thank you for sharing that with us. I'm going to turn now to Jane from KPMG, and I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to announce that we, uh, Jewel and KPMG, have e entered a very exciting partnership, which we're announcing today, which will marry Jewel's research expertise with KPMG's ability to translate that into action. And the question I'm going to ask you is really about the translation into action. So we've heard about regulatory approaches, you would deal with 
uh, businesses, uh, public service departments, organisations who are saying to themselves, we would not want to not only comply with the relevant regulation, we want to excel as we do that, but we don't know where to start. You know, how do you go about helping people work this through and actually aiming high on gender equality in their workplaces? Great, thank you very much. Um, it's lovely to be here as well. Uh, first of all, I will just acknowledge that we're very, very excited uh, at KPMG to have the opportunity to work with Juul. I've learnt the new um, acronym today. Uh, to work with Juul and really to take that opportunity to combine the power of evidence and data with the experience, the practical experience of creating real change in organisations, which is really uh, the focus of, of our business uh, in the people and change practice. And I might use an example to answer your question uh, in terms of how we bring the evidence base and actually combine that to lead to real change. Uh, if we think about the, com the comments um, that Professor Ryan made at the beginning around one of the key missteps that organisations uh, can take is the inability to recognise that it's a culture or a systemic issue within their organisation and a tendency to suggest that if we fix the women, the problem might go away. Uh, we work really closely with uh, organisations, our clients across all sectors uh, in Australia and particularly uh, in the public sector to really understand the deep cultural drivers that are occurring in that organisation that are leading to uh, this sense that the culture is not supportive of uh, workplace gender and other equality. So we work with them to understand what's going on across sort of the seven areas of, of culture uh, that, we, that we think about and then we help them to measure that progress is being made. And that's very much an adaptation, a learning cycle. We can see real opportunities to bring a much stronger and more rigorous research base, uh, an evidence base in how we support people, uh, organisations, leaders in organisations to really understand the nature of the progress that's being made and then to continue to adapt in order for that true cultural change to occur. So there's an opportunity as well um, on the other side of things to bring some of that practical experience of implementing real cultural change uh, into the research domain uh, as well and look at how we can combine that, that expertise. And do you find it hard to convince people? Do you need to put a case as to why change matters? I think uh, most organisations these days, uh, particularly through the environment, social um, and governance, the ESG agenda, uh, are very clear that they need to take action. And of course, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and, and other government agencies have made that pretty obvious to most organisations. Where I think it's difficult is often how to go about that change. So there might be a pretty clear view uh, that we do need to do something making the decision and then with discipline and rigour managing the change process is often where people uh, need some support. Uh, thank you for that. I'm going to turn to Geraldine now. Uh, we, it's Reconciliation Week. Uh, Michelle in her opening referred to intersectionality, to looking at the fact that um, you know, not all disadvantage is about gender. We get compounding uh, disadvantage. A, a friend uh, of mine in London uh, put this uh, beautifully. She works for a very uh, major global organisation that uh, went about diversifying its corporate board and did a big big unveiling of its new corporate board. Uh, my friend is a black woman. When they unveiled the corporate board, there were women on it, but all white women. And she did make the comment, well, you know, how does that relate to me? Uh, to which she was told, oh, don't worry, we're getting to racism next. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, that's not how people live their lives. You know that from the work you do with refugees. How can we make sure that as we're pursuing uh, greater diversity that it's true diversity from all perspectives? 
Um, thank you very much. Um, so I sit on the board of the ANU Centre for Asian Australian Leadership, um, which is partnering with Jewel and, and, and really excited to be part of this event. Um, so at the Centre for Asian Australian Leadership, what we're really recognising is that, that there is a gap in terms of ethnic representation across Australia's public institutions as well as the corporate sector. And so we're really trying to advocate and put in place evidence-based approaches um, to increasing that. Some of you may have seen that the Governance Institute and Watermark recently released the 2022 Board Diversity Index, um, and it showed that, again, the typical director of the ASX 300 companies is 60 years old, white, male, um, and from an anglo Celtic background. And in fact, while we're making progress in terms of appointing female directors, um, we've seen a 60 to 70 percent increase since 2016 in terms of the number of directors in the ASX 300. Cultural diversity is stagnating, so 90 percent of those directors in the ASX 300 are from an Anglo-Celtic background, and another three percent are European. Um, so, if you think about Australia's population, um, and and you think about the fact that that's stagnating, um, it's really quite problematic in terms of organisations being able to understand the customers, um, the markets that they're working with, their people, um, and just to really reflect what Australia looks like. Um, so we're really hoping that we can see things like cultural data legislation. Um, we've seen the impact that um, the Workplace Gender Equality Act had in terms of gender equality. So we'd love to see that. And also at CAL, the, the centre, we're also um, looking at um, a project around County for Change, so really getting ethnic diversity into the census in an appropriate way, um, following a, a, a process of research to identify how you would best do that, um, and also looking more at the business case around cultural diversity and leadership. And when you talk to people about change in this area, do they get it? Do you, do you find it hard to convince people that this broader approach to diversity is in the interests of their organisation? You mentioned in your answer, you know, for example, understanding your customer base. Do people see, apart from the doing the right thing driver, do they intuitively get that there can be productivity and economic drivers here? I mean, I think there's there's mixed there's mixed um, research, there's not very much recent research around this in terms of the business case. I think if you look at organisations themselves, I mean, there's there's many organisations that that do get it. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that all of the organisations that I've been a senior executive have had markets um, overseas and and you know strong um, customer base. In fact, at Virgin, we had a um, three directors who were from Asian backgrounds because they were our shareholders. Um, so. Um, you know, I think there's organisations that definitely do get um, that we need that representation. Um, but I think I think we've um, seen perhaps too much of an emphasis in terms of one aspect um, of diversity, in terms of thinking about, as you said, putting women onto boards and not casting the net wide enough in terms of thinking about the broader ethnic diversity that we need to represent. Um, so I think it's hard when we don't measure it. It's not in the census. Um, it's not in. Um, it's very hard for organisations to collect it. Um, they're self-reporting. That, that is done in some organisations. Um, but I think until we have an agreed methodology for how we capture that data, it's also hard to establish the business case as well. So we need some evidence to help us. Need some evidence. And, and Mary, are you going to add to that? I was, I was just going to um, give people an update is that we're now starting some work on how we collect that broader diversity data as part of the Wajia data set. And that will enable us with that data to do all the analysis that we do uh, on a gender basis, on a, on a broader diversity basis as well. But the work we've got to do is work out how we support employers to capture that information accurately in the first place, um, so they have the capacity to report through to us. But we've asked a question in this year's reporting, which is just um, underway at the moment, about who is collecting data. So we have that baseline of how many have got it already. Um, and so we're then in a position to say, well, let's start collecting it or um, actually doing the work to to help companies collect it so that we can too. But we're on a pathway for that, which I think is very exciting. Mm. Mm. And similarly, we, um, the Gender Equality Act in Victoria asks organisations to report on intersectional gender inequality. It's this time around, we've got very little data on that. And so looking, and we've been talking to Mary as well about how we collect this, this kind of data more routinely um, and in ways that don't cause people discomfort. 
Yeah, one of the interesting things that came out of the research I referred to earlier about uh, gender pay gap reporting is uh, when you uh, analyse uh, all of this globally, there's a lot of sensitivity in some nations to any form of um, ethnic diversity reporting. Uh, nations in Europe who obviously in uh, World War II saw genocidal violence against Jewish people. There's actually um, laws that prevent employers asking people about their ethnic background or recording their ethnic background because that's part of um, their, uh, you know, cultural predisposition about how you generate better equality. So um, it's it's interesting uh, to see those differences and happily we're in a nation where I think people would understand that getting this data can be a great uh, spur for change rather than a great spur to, for some forms of discrimination. So interesting global outlook. Mary, I'm going to come um, back to you. I know one of the things that uh, you're trying to do, the agency is trying to do, is to look at an employer of choice designation. And whenever we look at the economic data at the moment, um, often it's, it's full of uh, uh, talk about inflation and cost of living pressures. It's also uh, full of talk about skills and labour force constraints. Um, people are talking about the war for talent. How do their businesses get the people that they need? How does being an employer of choice play into that, the kind of decisions someone might make about where they would best prefer to go and work? So we've had an employer of choice for gender equality citation for um, a long time now. It's had uh, various uh, forms and we're in the process of reforming that to um, create a pathway for more companies to do it. About 120 companies are considered employers of choice, but they very clearly, and especially the ones who use it well, see it as a differentiator for their recruitment processes. Um, they see it as an opportunity to um, very clearly signal that they've gone through a comprehensive process um, that they care about these issues, that they're driving change, uh, they're continuing to improve because the, challenge, the, the, the criteria improves and gets harder each and every year. Um, so, um, but we also know about the current generation of employees, that they care about these things. They, they, they're values driven, that meaning and purpose is important, and they live equality in a way, uh, in a different way than, than my generation. Um, and and they have expectations in relation um, to uh, their workplaces um, and having a broader perspective. So um, I think the combination of being able to um, say that you're committed to it and that you're taking very serious action leading the way, combined with um, the workforce that's coming through, um, makes uh, these sort of citations significant differentiators and uh, attractors of talent. Could I add to that? Yes. Because I, I think in the current environment, in the, the very tight labour market that we find ourselves in, um, the ability of organisations to avail themselves of all of the available talent becomes even more important. We did a survey earlier this year, um, which is called What's Keeping Us Up at Night? It's a CEO survey of CEOs across Australia. And for the first time, talent was the top risk by a long way. Uh, and when uh, we were asking people to look three to five years out, talent was still one of the top risks. It, it trumps cyber uh, as risks that organisations and CEOs are seeing. So I think it's a real moment where the ability to attract and retain people, to attract them by making sure that we're not discriminating against anybody uh, in the labour market for you know dumb reasons, um, but also then the ability to create that sense of belonging and meaning that you talked about uh, becomes even more important at this, this moment in history. I'm surprised the answer to that wasn't counting in undecided seats is keeping people up at night, but it uh, all, all depends on the time frame of the uh, survey. Uh, Nikki, I'm going to come back to you and ask you to compare uh, the public sector with the private sector. Uh, many uh, people, I think, in the private sector uh, would think to themselves, look, it's a lot easier for the public sector. You don't have um, as many competitive pressures. You don't have um, the market bearing down on you about your share price, the quarterly returns, uh, all of that kind of stuff. It's much easier to do this big transformative change in a public sector environment. Do you think that's true? 
Look, I think um, perhaps it, it's true in some parts of the public sector, and it's certainly easier for government to regulate organisations over which they have a lot more control, and, um, and, and obviously public sector work work is using public money, it should be um, model, um, um, model work, they should be model workplaces. But when you think about um, the public sector, you think about police and emergency services, fire, um, you think about transport and logistics, and then you think about office work. Those are very different those are very different workplaces, and you have the same thing in the private sector. So I think the same principles apply, and the work that um, Mary's organisation, uh, Wajia, has been doing for, for, for many years is looking at what, um, what works in terms of um, uh, workplace gender equality, and we know that leadership's important. We know that measuring and reporting and making a plan and you know then measuring your progress and so forth are, are really important, and that applies, I think, across the board in, in any workplaces. So yes, there are some differences, but I don't think they're necessarily as big as we might make, we might think they are. But I think where we are, where what we know what works in some workplaces um, may have to be applied differently depending on the workplace um, situation. So you might, well, whilst it's important to have safe and respectful workplaces where women and anyone, men, people of other genders are not discriminated against, how you might go about um, intervening to create change might be different depending on the workplace and not just whether it's public or private sector. I'm going to ask now uh, about the post-COVID uh, environment, though even as I say post-COVID, I'm very careful about using that terminology because uh, the pandemic is by no means over and we're obviously sitting here with an audience all wearing masks, which we would not have done uh, before we were all uh, talking about and having our lives upended by COVID. Uh, but as people have gone back to work, the rigour of lockdowns has ended. Has this given us an opportunity to see change in the workplace? I'm going to turn first here to Jane. I think you're fond of referring to this period as volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Can you take us through all of those adjectives and what they spell? Sure, sure. So the word that's become VUCA. Um, yes, as you say, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous uh, absolutely characterises the nature of the environment that all of us find ourselves in across both public and private sector. And I think COVID really was just a, a, an acceleration of what we were already seeing uh, in the nature of the complexity in particular that organisations and leaders within them are grappling with. I think COVID gave us some positives uh, in terms of advancing uh, the, the idea that flexible working could work. You know, as we all know, we all did it overnight, notwithstanding those employees, of course, who uh, don't work in an office environment and, and have to turn up to work. Um, I think uh, if you look at the Productivity Commission study in September of last year, it highlighted that lots of people, in fact, the majority of people, three quarters, considered they were at least as productive working from home as they were uh, working in the office. Um, and the other piece of data that was interesting in there was that many employees um, were willing to accept a pay cut uh, or uh, change jobs in order to continue to work from home. Uh, so I think it's notable that um, while that's the case and while all of that uncertainty that we were faced with uh, meant that we were able to respond by working from home, I think one of the key things that we're now, as we come back into even if the workplaces are not quite what they were before, uh, is how we take the advantage of that, uh, particularly the flexibility that was awarded uh, to our people, and of course, the ability for employees to balance their work, balance is probably not the right word, to manage their work and their life uh, alongside each other um, and the opportunities to do that. Now, there's obviously some perceived costs in that, uh, where people perceive that perhaps the, the manager face time, uh, the uh, ability to have the water cooler conversations, the ability to engage in collaborative, creative work uh, can potentially um, be damaged. So I don't think we've 
landed on exactly what's going to happen yet, but I think we know that we've got to monitor the effects of this hybrid working uh, on all of those things that we already track around you know, gender pay gap, around, uh, around promotions, uh, around all those things where people have legitimate concerns. I'm going to ask if anybody else has got an observation on the post-COVID environment. I mean, one uh, thing that we've been thinking about at Juul is um, it, uh, it obviously uh, sounds fantastic um, for occupations that can combine uh, virtual work with in-office work, that there are, you know, plenty of options and people can, you know, self-select as to whether they're going to work from home or not. But I do think, given we know that domestic and caring labour is not equitably distributed, um, that there's a risk uh, that if nothing else changes in five years' time, what we'll see is a pattern where women have chosen, particularly women in the family formation stage, have chosen disproportionately to work at home. Uh, men have been much more regular attenders at the office and that very visibility, if nothing else changes, will show in who is being considered for promotion, who's being considered for sponsorship, mentorship, who's being put on the best of the training opportunities because the women will be kind of invisible behind the screen. Um, and a another thing I can certainly feel with the organisations that I work uh, with, um, that whilst the virtual working uh, did keep us going, the longer it's gone, uh, the more your organisation does become fractured along silo lines. So you might have a very productive working relationship with your immediate team, uh, but the further you get from that, the less um, sort of cultural, strategic, organisational cohesion you've got across the organisation. And when the project of equality is to make such a big difference across structures and cultures, I think that fragmentation is a bit concerning. Um, but are there other observations about how we could be grasping the moment in a positive way or dangers to look out for? Mary, did you want to add? Um, yeah, we see with some of, particularly some of our employers of choice, we're, we're hearing some of the stories about what people are doing and how they're managing it. And it's absolutely critical about being intentional and measuring and monitoring the impacts of that exactly as you've said. Um, we've got one, one employer of choice, Medibank, who talk about work as something you do, not somewhere you go, which really appealed to me in terms of thinking about it. But um, they have, for example, that all roles are flex and you have to justify um, why you're required to be in the office on certain days or from home and, and you work up a program for the employee for how it works for them. Um, and, you know, if, if um, you know, there's that flexibility there to have those conversations. Um, they also have uh, been very intentional about why you need to be in the office and what you're achieving in that time and, and what the objectives are there. Um, I think it's also important that we expand the definition of flex as working from home or not. There's other flexible work um, and you know people say, well, what about in employ workplaces where you have to be present? Well, maybe you could work longer days or you know um, four days in five or job share and some of those areas that haven't had the same focus, but build up the picture of what flex looks like so that it can work both for men and women um, as long as companies are then making sure they're very purposefully measuring the impact of that and that it's not a gendered outcome as well. Um, so just a couple of comments. The first, I think, in terms of one of the benefits we can harness is just that we've mainstreamed it more. And we've, uh, when we've tended to have more women working from home or flexibly before, we've had more men that have had that experience um, and understand more you know, the pros and cons and, and how to set it up. So I think that that's something that we can build on. But I do want to cover, I guess, um, that there's great disparities in, from, an, from an equity perspective, just in terms of you know, people's salaries or the types of jobs that they do. So for example, one of the things that we identified at Future Super um, is that people that had high incomes were more likely to have a home office or um, you know, to have facilities at home, whereas pe other people weren't and they were in share houses and they were just starting out, uh, they were living at home. It was much harder for them to do their jobs from home. So we introduced an allowance and we still have that um, for remote working um, where everyone that's paid a base of under $120,000 gets a $100 fortnightly allowance to help them you know, be able to work from home effectively and be set up for that. So I think that that's quite 
quite important um, and having facilities for, for, for people to go into the office if they need to for a whole range of reasons. Um, the other practice that I'm aware of with one of the other companies that I work with is, this was pre-pandemic but they, they still have it now, is that whenever there's somebody working flexibly and joining by video or joining by phone, everybody has to do that. So rather than having the dynamic that leads to what you're talking about in terms of the visibility in the office, so if they've got a meeting and five people are in the office and three people are working remotely, um, the five in the office go and they dial into the video from their desks rather than sitting in the meeting room. Um, and that's been the common practice and worked well then during COVID and continues to make sure that um, there's that equality in terms of how people are showing up at the meeting and that there's not sort of a side meeting going on as part of that meeting. So I think we have to be really intentional about some of those practices. Yeah, I, I do think over time we're also going to see more and more uh, technological developments that even if some people are in a room, the, the vision that you're getting, I mean this is already happening, the vision you're getting if you're dialled in remotely and your sense of presence in the room is different than, you know, a lot of people would only have the technology now where if you've dialled in remotely you can just see tiny little people that big all gathered round a meeting table and you're so visibly on the outside of it. I think that will shift. Nikki, is there anything you wanted to say about this COVID moment and, and as we uh, design the new world, what we could be doing better on gender? Yeah, I think it's probably mostly already been said. I wrote a, um, an op-ed for um, a Victorian newspaper a couple of weeks ago about proximity bias, that, that, that potential um, for you not being present and not being seen and so forth, and the need for us not to say, well, we're not having flexibility because of that, but to actually d deal with it, which is what both, both um, Mary and Geraldine have just spoken about. I think the, uh, uh, my own experience was, um, and the experience of my team was, uh, you know, I got the job, uh, um, came into Victoria um, to set up a commission under lockdown. And so we've, we've been a virtual team for the entirety of, of, of implementing this legislation. Some of my team members I didn't meet for in person for months and months and months. Um, and so now we can't say, well, you have to come into the office because we know that everyone's been able to work perfectly well, um, some from their home, home bedrooms uh, and things like that. But um, we do now have an office and we, we've made a commitment, different to what you were saying, Geraldine, that, um, that every meeting every event, we will have a hybrid option. So we have got people in the team, in the workplace and um, and online. And so far that's actually working well, but I guess we're very used to that environment. It's new for us to actually come and be together uh, as a team. But it's, it's, a, it's a unique experience, I think, but particularly to us. Can I just add that I think one of the, the key things we've seen, like many things that COVID's done, is it's spotlighted poor leadership practices and poor management practices. And it's helped us to see that in fact, that management by control or management by presentism was always ineffective. You know, the focus on outcomes is what we really need to, to, to focus on. Uh, and there's a, in the recent Global Institute paper, uh, Manuela Tomei, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, talked about what would a gendered equal approach to remote working like, look like and her point was supporting managers in dispersed workforces to shift away from management by control uh, to management by results. And I think that's really at the heart of how we enable the hybrid and the remote working to work. But we're going to have to train our middle managers. I, I, mean, I, mean, I think that that's the thing that follows your point, Jane, is, is the middle managers, is where they're going to bear the brunt of this. Um, so we've got to put the skill building in for that management in a hybrid context that no one's developed that training yet. And, and so that's, that's the gap that we need to get onto, I think, to make sure then it can succeed, succeed within organisations and people can you know, manage team, teams effectively. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with that. And then, of course, there is, uh, you know, if you meet people for the first time that you've only been dealing with on Zoom, the, wow, you're really tall effect, or maybe that <laughs> only happens to me, but everybody seems taller than I imagined they were going to be. Um, and Geraldine, I'm going to uh, come to you uh, on the question of money, because you know a lot about money, and you know a lot about investing, and you know a lot about um, ethical investing. And 
and uh, you know many uh, sources of capital now are being very discriminating on um, environmental grounds and other ethical grounds so they you know don't want to put their money into a business uh, that isn't doing the right thing by climate change they'd be much prefer to direct their investments to you know organizations and businesses that are on the right side of climate change history um, you know there's all sorts of other ethical reasons people look at when they're investing um, there's been a lot of campaigning for example on the um, anti-slavery work to make sure that nowhere in your investment chain or your supply chain is anybody using forced labour and the list goes on but in a world where there is quite a long list of things for an ethical investor to consider how do we make sure gender equality, diversity more broadly are on that list that they're preferring businesses that are an employer of choice, to use the language that we've been using now. Um, yeah, absolutely. So perhaps I'll start just by talking about some of the approaches that we take at Future Super. Um, so we were set up to really create a future free from climate change and inequality. And if we look at the way that we invest, um, for example, in listed equities and for our Verve Super um, fund, um, we don't invest in any companies um, that don't have at least one female director on the board. Um, and then in terms of Verve Super, as, as I'm sure you may know, um, we actually created a special index based off the Wajia, um, off the Wajia data. Um, we set out a number of things that were important to us from a gender equality perspective and built a special index that, that's used for the Verve Super Fund that only invests in companies that are that hitting good data. So again, it shows the value of having this public data um, and then we can then do that. Now we do that in addition to screening um, for fossil fuels and climate change um, and so on. And really what we're trying to do is drive systemic change. So if our success is that everyone's investing in that way and really trying to use the power of your money um, to invest from that perspective. So we think it's just good business, it's just social license to operate, to focus on um, gender equality and to focus on, on these issues. And I think it's becoming increasingly important um, to the generations that are coming through. So I think we're starting to really see people shifting their money um, and really focusing on it. So for me, it's not an either or. Um, I think we have to do both. Um, and I think we've, we've seen that really clearly come through from the Australian um, population as well in the last couple of weeks in terms of that theme of, of doing both. So there's ways to do it. Um, it's important and more and more companies are starting to do it. But again, I think just like um, ASIC's been looking at greenwashing in terms of people saying um, that they're doing it but not actually doing it, we need to think about how we're doing the same around um, gender equality. So organisations, you know, saying that they're investing their money in that way or even, you know, saying that they've got the gender, gender approaches but aren't doing it really. So we need to make sure that ASIC's looking out for that as well in terms of how we um, communicate and, and what you're able to say about how you invest. How widespread, though, do you think that equality piece is? I mean, I can, um, you know, absolutely there would be a lot of um, investment vehicles now that um, would be very aware uh, that if they uh, invested in a way that was uh, seen to be counter the, to the climate change agenda, that there would be a real <laughs> reputational risk around that. Um, do you think that in the, the broader investing market, people sense that there's also emerging reputational risks around not doing due diligence on gender and diversity? Or is that we're just at the start of that? And if so, what more can and should we be doing? I mean, you know, people in the audience here probably thinking to themselves, I'd love to run a venture capital fund, but I don't. You know, are there things that individuals can be doing? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, look, I think, I think um, climate has definitely become um, really significant. And again, we, we've seen that with the influence that Mike Cannon-Brooks has had on the AG, AGL demerger in the last couple of weeks. So I think um, decisions like that get people to sit up and say, hang on, this is really coming. And every board in Australia will be looking around and saying, you know, what kind of exposure do we have um, in terms of the way we make decisions? I don't think we're as progressed in terms of gender equality in terms of the decision-making process. Um, but I think 
think we are more progressed in terms of having some of the data and the metrics to make those decisions from. And there's been a really big movement um, around around that. I think you know the more that um, that company that we you know we're dear that um, everyone starts publishing um, data around um, who doesn't have female directors, who doesn't have the gender equality. And I think this goes to to what you're saying in terms of the next iteration and building on um, we're dear in terms of having that greater transparency um, because we don't always have the greater transparency around things like pay equity around those policies. Um, certainly, I think in, in the work that, that I've done with um, going around and speaking to institutional um, investors and, and those that are making taking votes in terms of, um, you know, um, at the um, annual general meetings, they're starting to ask more questions. So with BlackRock and others really starting to drive that movement and ask questions of companies, what are you doing about gender? What are you doing about sustainability? That's getting boards, chairs, um, you know, chairs of remuneration communities to sit up and kind of watch what's going. So I think in terms of what we, what, as individuals, what we can do is we can move our own money. Um, we can really ask those questions of our, you know, funds of our investors and where we're investing our own personal money. Um, obviously we can, um, we can also ask questions within our own companies about what's happening um, in terms of how we're investing money and really, really hold our companies to account internally as well. And then we can support the movement to, to greater reporting and more data that helps us to make these decisions. In the minutes that ra remain to us, I want to um, uh, circle back to where, where I started. Obviously, uh, we're here. Uh, there's a new government. Uh, what, uh, if, if you were giving the uh, incoming minister, uh, if you were writing the, here you are, please do the following three things, uh, what, would, what would those three things be? And please don't confine yourself necessarily to uh, the person uh, holding, um, you know, the equality uh, portfolio. If you were thinking about everything that government does and you're in a position to slip a post-it note in that said, do this, or slip three post-it notes in. Uh, I'm not meaning to imply from that that ministers only read post-it notes. That's not true. <laughs> Please do not walk away with that impression. Uh, but what would you put on it? Oh, I, I, I had the magic wand question here because I've heard your podcast and you asked that question. Um, I would have acts like the Gender Equality Act in Victoria right across Australia, um, I think, uh, and, and, and like the workplace gender equality, um, the, the sorts of extensions to it that Mary's talking about, I think this is, a, a, it's not the only way, it's not the silver bullet, but it's a really important um, thing to do. But, but there, are, there are all the other things as well that support women um, working and we need men to take on the responsibility uh, for caring and emotional work uh, if we're ever going to have equality. So if I could wave my magic wand and um, suggest some ways to government to do that, I would certainly be pushing that along as well as things like universal childcare and, um, you know, the, um, and paid parental leave that um, requires men to take it or lose it. Basically. Those magic wands, unfortunately, are in short supply, aren't they? Hard it's to get annoying. your hand on one. But um, <laughs> uh, if you had one, Jane, what would you do? Certainly the childcare issue, I think, that is very much on the agenda. Uh, and obviously uh, KPMG has been very vocal in the support for that, both the societal as well as the economic benefits of, of greater investment in the childcare subsidies. So I think that is on the agenda and I would put that at the top of the list, I expect, on the basis that without that, we're just not getting the full participation of, of women in particular uh, in, in the workplace. Uh, indigenous reconciliation would be at the very top of my list. Uh, again, a broader equality issue. Uh, and I think as well, some of the commentary, I would echo your point about the, co the commentary about the work for, um, that you do, Mary, uh, with your agency and continuing to strengthen that. Geraldine. Um, so before um, the election, the Chief Executive Women put together a very compelling research-based platform, um, and I'm very supportive of the key four recommendations that they had. So first of all, would be investing in, in a well-paid, secure care sector, um, because I think the more that we can get um, you know, better pay and better conditions um, into childcare and education and aged care is fundamental um, in terms of achieving gender equality both for the, and gender pay um, equality, both for those in the sector, but also 
of supporting more women to be able to participate in the workforce. Um, the second thing is that I would expand the Commonwealth paid parental leave, um, really take that to at least 26 weeks, um, preferably 52, um, and really have that um, shared, equal share, so a use it or lose it provision in terms of making sure that that's shared across men and women because I think the more that both um, men and women are involved in the early stages, the more likely that's going to be reflected going through um, you know, the different stages of, of parenting. Um, and then um, universal childcare. Um, get more um, childcare. I and I think this is a particularly an equality issue because we really do need to not, I mean, I think we started talking about um, some of the issues around, you know, sort of people that do have more money. We often talk about, you know, directors and senior leadership, but we really need to make sure that everybody makes sense for everybody to be able to get into the workforce and that it doesn't cost more for childcare um, or for early childhood, you know, education. So we need to, I would absolutely put that in place. I think that's fundamental. I feel we're all in furious agreement here. So um, let me, you know, in, a, in addition to everything that's been said, I think there's a real opportunity, especially with the focus on childcare and, and some of the low paying um, care and um, sectors, is to really try and take, and it's probably a generational change, but address feminised and masculinised industries and really go to gender stereotypes, which often underpin um, a lot of the issues that we have um, in workplaces across the board and certainly in some of um, our highly gender segregated workforces. So I think not only addressing some of the pay issues, but really going to the heart of um, why is the care sector 80% women? Um, why have we only got, you know, 20% uh, women working in some of the construction and mining and uh, more masculinised industries and how do we uh, create different pathways and a significant part of that is pay but it, but there's a lot of stereotypes that are that are behind that that we need to shift as well in addition to of course childcare and parental leave and um, and of course uh, enhancing our capacity um, as a as you know a, a collector of information and a driver of change so um, lots of agreement there across the panel I think. I think a, a lot of agreement. I think that magic wand would be nice to find. We're searching for it. Uh, but whilst we're handing out uh, post-it notes for action, uh, for uh, the people in our audience today, if you could set them a bit of homework about what they could take out of dis today's discussion and potentially do in their own workplace, their own organisation. Obviously, people will be at uh, different occupations, different positions, but are there um, sort of things that people can take take from today as an action step themselves. Um. I guess um, if your organisation isn't already doing it, encourage um, a workplace gender equality audit. Have a look at to have a look a good look at where you stand. Um, you hear whenever you ask organisations who haven't done it, they always say, "Well, there's not a problem with our workplace." Um, but uh, invariably, they will find uh, something that is. Uh, that does need to be addressed in terms of gender inequality. And, and I think the starting point is if you're not already doing it, do an audit and then make a plan to act on anything that needs to be done to address any inequality that you find. I think one of the most critical things to do is to um, influence your organisation to make parental leave about men and women, not just about mothers. Uh, we've recently done that at KPMG and the signalling that it gives to our organisation that's got a long pay forward uh, on it in terms of generational change and, and men talking about, um, you, you know, that it doesn't disrupt your career, it's a moment in time and you do come back in and you are able to continue with a long and productive career despite the fact that you've taken time off uh, to look after your children and obviously uh, all of the societal benefits that go with that as well. So that would be the top of the list for me. Um, so I'd urge everyone to really think about the role of bias and unconscious bias. Um, Recognise that we all have a form of bias and, and start with that in, in a few ways. One, in terms of thinking about the fact that bias is formed in the early years, really if you've got children or you're interacting um, with, you know, with our kids, really thinking about how you're breaking down stereotypes and helping to expose them um, to a wide range of you know, cultural experiences and seeing you know, equal caregiving and, and really starting to think about how we, how we have respectful relationships really early on. And then within the workforce, really thinking about how do you how do you be aware of biases, and when do you take systemic 
um, interventions to tackle them. So for example, there's great platforms out there like Applied, where you can do um, de-identified recruiting, um, where you're not looking at CVs, um, you're not looking at names, um, but all of your candidates are applying answering a set of questions, and then you, um, you assess the candidates based on their answers to those questions, and compare the questions rather than comparing the candidates. Um, so there's, there's nudges like that that can help us to address some of that bias. So think about what are the right interventions for your organisation to acknowledge we all have bias, how are we gonna, how are we gonna address it? And uh, one of our best kept secrets, I think, is that on the Wajir website, we have a wealth of information about every employer, private sector employer with more than 100 employees. Uh, it doesn't have the remuneration data yet, but it has everything else. It's got boards, it's got makeup of the management and non-managers, it's got, uh, have they done a, a, a gender pay gap audit, uh, and what action was taken as a result, or why didn't they take action? What are the policies and, and practices in place? So you can actually go and have a look at your own employer, or anyone that you're thinking about going and working for, and then ask the question, start the conversation, generate that discussion um, about, well, what have we done? Why haven't we done it? You know, how is that, what impact has that had? And, and be part of uh, the, the momentum for change. But being informed by the information, it's there, and we really try to, to raise the profile that this information is available. Um, we want people to use it and then use that to be a driver of change. Thank you very much. You come to a discussion at a university, you get homework. That's just the way that it is. Uh, but I am going to uh, thank people for coming and thank the panel just in those brief words. But what I'm really going to do uh, is invite Professor Michelle Ryan back onto the stage. Michelle. Everyone, join me in thanking our chair and our wonderful panel. Such an informative discussion. I think I started by setting the tone in a kind of negative way. What are the things that people get wrong? And I think we've definitely elevated it to find out what people are doing and what they're getting right. And it's very exciting to see all the initiatives that are happening and what's going on there. So we titled our, our talk today, our, our panel today, about what works. And, and I think we've had a lot of examples, some very concrete examples of what works. There was a lot of talk about data and evidence. So whether that's in terms of finding an evidence base for what needs to change, or using data and metrics and audits to find out what has worked and what is successful and what isn't. So I feel like that evidence base came, came through very, very clear. Other themes were around accountability and transparency. So really making sure that people have to say what they will do and they will be accountable for what they do, whether that's in terms of consequences or rewards or whether it's carrots or sticks. I think there are a number of ways in which we can do that, but accountability really is key. And I think what was really clear to me was about this intentionality. So often when we talk about gender and gender equality, we get a sort of feeling like we know what equality looks like and we know what we sort of need to do. But this really idea about acting intentionally and not just feeling like it'll work out okay in the end and having a very clear plan about how that works. I think in terms of what is needed to, to affect change, resources, I think, is something that came through loud and clear as well. This is something that we have to resource, whether that's in terms of people's time, whether that's in terms of legislative resources, if we think about it in those sorts of ways, um, and that time to allow change to happen as well. Whether it's in terms of quotas, in terms of support, there are a lot of mechanisms that we've seen today that can affect change as well. But I think what also comes to me is that there's no one easy solution. I mean, if we knew what the silver bullet was, we would have used it a long time ago. So the complexity that's coming out is really, really key to me as well, that we need to be making change on multiple fronts and in multiple ways. So whether that's at federal, state, organizational sort of level, whether we're talking about individuals that need to change, and I think that final discussion about what individuals can do to change is really important, whether we're looking at public or private, whether we're looking at legislative or um, cultural change, policy change. There's, it's something that I think we need to attack, attack on multiple fronts. And I think we have now some of the inspiration and some of the evidence base on really what works. So please, everyone, join me again in thanking our fantastic panel.